at the words of gathering that are printed in the bulletin and on the screen. This is from um, Father Henry Nowen. The discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all I am and have is given to me as a gift of love, a gift to be celebrated with joy. Gratitude as a discipline involves a conscious choice. I can choose to be grateful even when my emotions and feelings are still steeped in hurt and resentment. I can choose to be grateful when I am criticized even when my heart still responds in bitterness. There's always the choice between resentment and gratitude. Our song of praise is everything that has won. Every kind of living thing, livestock, crawl. 
Justine. Hi, Noel. Hi, Luca. I'm Miss Catherine. Did you know that? I'm wearing my name tag. Um, you are brothers. And I know you're not Zach. Oh, is it Aaron? Oh, no. Your mom's here. Um, I always get this wrong. I know your name's in the Bible. Yes? Luke. Yeah, Luke. You're the Gospel of Luke, man. You're one of the disciples. And then your youngest brother is Joe. Jack. Uh, Michael. Paul. Hey. Aaron. No, your mom's here. Okay, what's your name? Jacob. Oh, Jacob. Okay. And then this guy uh, is your brother. No, not your brother, your cousin. Um, Peter. Uh, Dan. No, Dan's over there. Um, David. Uh, Peter. Okay. Ryan. I didn't really know that, Ryan. Okay, so I'm Miss Catherine, and I get to do children's message today. So guess what? I am very excited. I love doing the children's message. Um, my daughters grew up here. One of them lives in Paris, France, and one lives in New York. But they grew up here in this very church. And every time of Thanksgiving weekend, right, this is Thanksgiving weekend, did anybody eat turkey? Chicken? Nothing pie. What did you eat, Noel? What was your name? Nothing uh, pie. Oh, uh, mashed potatoes. Okay, mashed potatoes. I got that right. So, but every time on this weekend of Thanksgiving, something's gonna change. Something's gonna change. Look around. What colors do you see on the altar and the pyramids hanging from the lectern and the pulpit? What colors do you see? Bluish, greenish. Look at the altar cloth behind us on the communion table. It's green, right? So we've been, as Christians in the liturgical, in the church year, we've been moving through something called ordinary time. Doesn't that sound boring? <laughs> ordinary time. Come on. But in the Christian church, ordinary time is a very exciting time because we're always hearing stories and singing songs and praying prayers of Jesus' life among us, showing us how to live as disciples, as students, as children of God. So it's been green. Why? Because the trees are green. What are the evergreen trees? What color are the evergreen trees? Green. Aren't they pretty today with the snow? Really pretty. We bring the evergreen tree into our house. Have some of you put up your Christmas trees? Anybody? Not yet? You have? So it's green to bring the green inside to remember, to help us remember that life is, um, our lives are blessed and green is forever. Ever green. Okay, so Ryan, what color are you wearing today? Blue. I'm pretty sure when we do the hanging of the greens, decorating this beautiful sanctuary space, that the color is going to change. We're going to put up an Advent wreath. Some of you have lit the candles on that every Sunday. That's going to start next Sunday. Everything here is going to change to prepare the way for baby Jesus to be born. I'm pretty sure we use blue. Yeah, sometimes in the old church it was purple. But there's been changes. And change can be very, very good as we prayed in that opening prayer. Good, very, very good. And my favorite thing is the Holy Family. Do you remember, Luca, how we set up the manger here? And um, there's a camel. When you help today, sit on that camel. It's a great feeling. All our kids have done it. Gently, but it's very big. It will take your weight. I'm not kidding. This is very important to create, have our memories. You might want to sit on the camel as well. But we will put the Holy Family here, Joseph, Mary, as we wait for the baby Jesus. I am so grateful. Yes. Oh, Pastor Bob. Yeah, no. No, you got to be under 12. Okay, 12 and under. Good point. Thank you for saying that. But really, friends, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so grateful to be here and call First United Methodist Church of Park Ridge, my church home. When I go out in all these churches where I speak, 
They say, where's your church? And I say, oh, it's First United Methodist Church in Park Ridge. It's always so wonderful to share that. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. And I hope you are too. Let's pray. Now, wait, do we have Sunday school today? Yes. yes. Okay, so there is Sunday school after we pray. All right, but let's pray with our hands open. Wide open, right? Because this is the way to express our thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for your gentle love. Thank you, God, for your good, good love. And we ask you to be, bring peace into our hearts. In Jesus' name, touch your heart. Amen. All right. Off you go. Thanks for being here. Youth to Youth Half Sunday School.
for you this morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Our Greek Testament reading this morning is Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with a skin disease approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out to him, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with, God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Well, good morning. I, uh, I want to tell you something about myself uh, that you might not know. And uh, that is that I complain a lot. I complain a lot, mostly to myself. I don't usually say these things out loud to people. Uh, but you know, I was recently on an airplane and the uh, flight attendant wasn't really doing her job. She was wandering down the aisle and she'd say, what do you want? And I thought, what do you want? I just paid hundreds of dollars to be on this plane. You know, you could ask me politely. But uh, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. But I was complaining to myself. The same thing happens in traffic. I mean, come on, where are all these cars coming from? And why do they have to be out at the same time as me? <laughs> so anyway, I complain sometimes. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, uh, let the words of my mouth and all our thoughts and meditations today be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I, uh, I remember getting Christmas presents from some of my relatives when I was young. Uh, my mom had an aunt, uh, an elderly aunt. We could, I called her Aunt Rini. Her, her real name was Irene. Um, and Rini uh, had no idea what a seven-year-old boy wanted for Christmas, you know. And so I always got like a shirt and a tie, or uh, you know, maybe maybe a scarf or something. And I would tear open the box and I'd look at whatever it was, and then I'd move on to the next gift. And my mom inevitably would say. What do you say? What do you say? And I would say the magic words, thank you. And then I'd not really mean it. I would just go on. 
Well, Stanley Hauerwas, um, he's a professor of Christian ethics at Duke. I think actually he was one of Scott, Pastor Scott's professors. Uh, anyway, he's a wonderful teacher and he's written a ton of books. I mean, I think he's written 30 books. Um, and in a paper that he wrote, uh, the paper was called A Community of Character Toward a Constructive Christian So-Called Social Ethic. Um, academic papers always have long titles. Anyway, he tells a story about a gift that he was given. And his sin of ingratitude. He says that uh, when he was a student at Yale Divinity School, his father, who was a Texas bricklayer, um, was building from scratch a deer rifle. He was boring the barrel, he was setting the sight, he said he uh, hand carved the stock of the gun. And during Christmas vacation, Harwas was home and his father showed him this beautiful rifle. And Hauerwas didn't realize that his father was making it for him. That it was a gift. It was going to be a gift for him when it was done. And he said, you know, I was flushed with theories about the importance of truthfulness and irrationality of our society's gun policy. And I said, of course, you realize that it will not be long before we as a society have to take these things away from you. And Harawas says it was one of the lowest points of his moral development because he simply wasn't morally mature enough to know how to respond properly to a gift. It was a social issue for him instead of a gift. And what he didn't see was the giver who was behind the gift and all the work that his dad was putting into making this rifle for him. And now he knows that his moral issue at the time was ingratitude. Contrast that to the story of Pam, uh, who worked in downtown Chicago with me every morning uh, she took the train downtown and then would, drive, would walk over to our office and uh, she often went past a kind of heavy-set woman in a shabby coat who was asking for money. And Pam was one of these people who always could find some change and so she found change every day pretty much and gave, gave this woman a little bit of something and, uh, and the woman would respond and say, good morning, good morning, thank you so much. Pam almost always gave her something, and after a year or more of this routine, uh, the woman in the shabby coat kind of disappeared. And Pam talked to me about it and wondered what had happened to her. And then one day, she's walking down, uh, I think it was Monroe Street, and, and uh, she, was, she was there again, the, the, the shabby, woman in the shabby coat was there again, still wearing the same shabby coat. And Pam reached into her purse to, to get some change to give to her, and she said, oh, no, no, thank you for helping me all those days. You won't see me again because I got a job. And with that, she reached into a bag and handed Pam a little bag, kind of a package, that uh, she'd been standing there with a bag full of donuts giving them to all the people who had given her change over the years, saying thank you. She was thankful. Of course, our, our scripture lesson today is about the ten lepers uh, who approached Jesus and asked him for mercy. And in those days, you know, leprosy, what we now call Hansen's disease, was a terrible, terrible tragedy for people because they became very disfigured. They lost limbs and hands and, and, and fingers, sometimes noses. They had lesions all over their bodies. Um, and they weren't, and the biggest problem with it really was that it was contagious. And so people were isolated. They, they weren't allowed to be with other folks because everybody was afraid of this disease. And so they would actually wear bells around their necks so that folks would know that they were coming and, and, and they would 
uh, say as they as they walk. Um, they, they would they would often say leper, leper. Anyway, this day they see Jesus and they ask Jesus for mercy, and it all happens very quickly. You know, Jesus Jesus says, "Oh, just go go show the priest and you'll be healed." And and sure enough, they turned around to go and see the priest and they were all healed, and 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 they were made clean. It says in our scripture. But then one of them saw what had happened to him and uh, went back and he falls at Jesus' feet and he gives thanks to God. And Jesus was wondering, and I'm wondering a little bit, where were the others? What about the other nine? And, and I've given a little thought to this. This week I, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about what, what the heck was happening with the other nine? And uh, at first, I, you know, I wanted to think to myself, well, they just weren't grateful. You know, they just weren't grateful people. But I, th I don't think that's really the case. Uh, there are lots of other possibilities. You know, maybe they were just overwhelmed by their good fortune. I mean, I don't see a lot of people who win the lottery kind of getting up and saying, thank you so much to all the people who put this together and made this possible for me. No, you know. You, you just you just think they're I think they're just overwhelmed. They're just blown away by their good fortune. Or or as an admitted complainer, uh, I wonder if some of them were actually even resentful. You would think he would have healed us before I lost my finger, you know. Or shoot, now I got to go back to that job that I hate. <laughs> There are a million reasons why some of the others didn't return to Jesus. Maybe they were just doing what they were told. You know, go and show yourself to the priests. But for whatever reason, they didn't return. And they missed out, actually. Sure, they were healed from their disease. But we need to do just a little bit of word study here um, to see what they missed out on. So I went back to my, I've got a Bible that's got one line in English and one line in Greek. I went back to it and uh, I want to look at some of the words that they use for healed. Because it's used several times in this passage that we read. The first verse is 15, verse 15, it says one of them when he saw he was healed. And that word is uh, Iafe, and, and Iafe is kind of a medical word, really. It, it's kind of the, the word that you would use if a bone was healed or if you recovered from a cold or something. It's Iafe. But in verse 17, Jesus says, We're not all ten cleansed? And the word here for cleansed is a long word. Ekatharis the son. Ekathar is the son. And it's the word that we get our word catheter from. Uh, to clean out, you know, you clean stuff out. And, uh, and, and this would be like what the priests were looking for, a, a, a cleansing. Um, but there's one more word. And this is all the way down in verse 19. Jesus says to the man who did thank him, he says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. But this time, the word well isn't one of those other two words. This time, the word is sesokan. Sesokan. And it means not just to be made well, but to be saved. To be saved. It's the same word uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, an angel comes down and uh, tells Joseph, you're, you're to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from his sins. That's the same word, to save the people. So, so can. And so when Paul described what, what happened to a person who publicly professed Jesus as his Savior, he used the same word in Romans. So, so can. And so the person who came back and thanked Jesus. He's the one man, the one person who was saved. The others were healed, 
But the one who thanked him was saved. Henry Nowen, the, the same priest that we read earlier, says this. He says, both trust and gratitude require the courage to take risks because distrust and resentment in their need to keep their claim on me keep warning me how dangerous it is to let go of my careful calculations and guarded predictions. At many points, I have to make a leap of faith to let trust and gratitude have a chance. The leap of faith always means loving without expecting to be loved in return, giving without waiting to receive, inviting without hoping to be invited, and holding without asking to be held. And every time I make a little leap, I catch a glimpse of the one who runs out to me and invites me into his joy, the joy in which I can find not only myself, but also all my brothers and sisters. You know, gratitude has become something of a psychological treatment lately. I don't know if you've read about this, but there have been a lot of studies in the psychological community that talk about how uh, if uh, you have depression or anxiety, one of the things that you can do is every night write down five things that you're grateful for from that day or from any time, just five things that you're grateful for. And what they have found is that uh, after a number of weeks of doing this, uh, your depression resolves a little bit. Your anxiety decreases, uh, and what, what happens is that your mind, your brain, becomes more uh, able to recognize events during your day that you will be grateful for later on when you write those down. And so it's something that I often use with, uh, with patients. It's something that uh, people have been, have been talking about how uh, wonderful it is, and, and, and yet sometimes the folks I deal with have had really terrible things happen to them. A lot of them are veterans who were in awful situations. And, and, uh, and they come to me and they say, well, I don't, I don't have anything to be grateful for. Uh, look at what happened to me, and I've lost my family, and I've lost my friends. I, I don't have anything to be grateful for. Well, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I was watching a video on YouTube. It was a, uh, an interview between Stephen Colbert, the late night talk show host, and Anderson Cooper, who was doing the interviewing from CNN. Uh, this is just after Anderson Cooper had lost his mother. His mother was uh, Gloria Vanderbilt, and uh, she died. And they were talking about loss. And he, he asked Colbert, he said, I, you know, I heard um, that uh, you had a terrible tragedy happen to you when you were just young. And then he said, yeah, you know, when I was six, my dad and, and two of my brothers were killed in an airplane crash. And, and uh, Cooper said, well, the, weird, the funny thing about that is that I heard that you said that you had come to love the thing that you had most wished had not happened. And Colbert said, yeah, you know, I, I have. And, um, and he said, how can it be that, that, that uh, a punishment from God is a gift? This is the question that Anderson Cooper asked. And Colbert said, well, my view is that it's a gift to exist. And with existence comes some suffering. There's no escaping that. Everybody suffers in life at some point. Everybody's got issues and problems. I don't want it to have happened. I don't want to have lost my dad and my brothers. But if you're grateful for your life, then you have to be grateful for all of it 
You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. I thought that was great. You can still see it on YouTube. It's a great interview. I hope you'll look at it. A little while ago, a couple of years ago now, actually, I got a phone call from a number that I didn't recognize. Turned out that it was from a woman who I had done a wedding service for about 20 years previously. And she said to me, you know, I, I don't know if you remember us, but when we came to see you, we were desperate. Uh, Terry and I were both divorced, and because of that, none of the other churches in town would marry us. You were the only one. So I just wanted to call and tell you that we're really happy and that we've got three kids now and we love our life together. And I wanted to thank you for making that possible. Well, I'll tell you what, I was on cloud nine for a week or so after that call. I just couldn't believe that she remembered to give me a call 20 years later. And I'll tell you what, I still complain all the time to myself. I want to change that, though. I want to be more like that woman who gave me a call. I want to be more like the leper who came back. I want to be more thankful. And wouldn't it be great if we could all be a little more like that? I just think it would make a difference in our church. Don't, don't just think it would make a difference in our community. Don't just think it would make a difference in our world. I, I think it might. I think it's just might. Our hymn of response is uh, number 102 in the hymnal. It's now thank we all our God.
pray with me? We, uh, we have prayer cards in all the pews, um, and we ask that you fill those out with any joys or concerns that you have that we can then lift up to the Nurture Ministries prayer tree. Let's pray together now. Gracious and eternal God, we come to you with difficulties in our lives and in our hearts. We pray for the people of the world who are struggling with war in so many places and the terrible tragedies that we read on the news. We thank you, God, for the peace that we may find in our lives. We thank you for this community and for the love that is shared between each of us. We thank you for family and friends. And we ask that you would be with all of those who are sick. We pray for Ashton and her family and the death of her grandmother. And we pray, Lord, for uh, Maggie, whose father is struggling with cancer. We pray, God, for all those who are in the hospital and ill, looking for help and looking for a blessing from you. We pray for uh, people in Chicago who are struggling with violence in their communities. And we pray for the people all around the world who are trying to find peace and, and uh, stay away from the, the terror that comes from um, violence that they see street to street, person to person, and family to family. We, we thank you, God, for this week in which we're able to be with our families, many of us, and, and to partake of your bounty, the amazing food that we had. We, we thank you for that, and we thank you for this upcoming season of Advent which we can take some time to contemplate the coming of the Christ child into the world and what that means for us, even today. And so, God, we, we come to you with all these things. And we ask that you would be with us, that you would soften our hearts and enlighten our minds, that you would give us all that we need to be able to go out into the world and serve you. And all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we enter into a time when we can make a difference in the lives of others through our tithes and our offerings and the work that we do. And so we ask that uh, as the ushers come forward, uh, you would find a way to uh, give generously.
Gracious and holy God, we ask that you would bless these gifts and allow us to use them to do your work in the world. Multiply them much like the mustard seed so that it expands way beyond our own comprehension. Allow us to do good works in our own backyards, in, in those places where we work and where we live. Allow us to find new ways to give of ourselves, not just of our monetary gifts. We ask all this, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. On this holiday season, singers, uh, a favorite song. <laughs> Thank you.